All right, I see some of you uh, processing. Um, I'll do it one more time. Let's see. You tell me who's the donor. Betty. Betty. Betty A. Negative. Positive blood will have antigen B circles, squares, RH antigen, and the antibody against A. The baby will have A antigen and the antibodies against B RH. If A is the donor, Consider the antigens that she's donating. You consider what the cross react. Yeah, A's can't donate to B's, basically. But, to phrase it correctly, what you would say is Betty's A antigen on her RBCs will react with George's antibody against A. <clears throat> you have to say what cross reacts. All the blood types who can donate, who can recipient, or receive, is on this chart. So let's see if we can understand it, take away a few generalities, generalities here. So to understand the chart, all the blood types are listed on both axes. Any person can donate or receive, so let's say all these blood types, you're the donor there, all these blood types, you're the recipient there. The check means it's okay. So for example, O negatives, or excuse me, O positives can donate to O positives, right? So if you're the donor, you can give blood to this person. So the arrow goes that way. And so check mark means okay. So one, one general rule is, if you're the same type as someone else, you can give to that person. That's common sense. But now you know why. The reason is that same blood, you don't have an antibody that will attack the, the blood you receive. That's why. So the generalities are, let me, let me ask you one question. Just in terms of the RH. <coughs> in positives, Donate two negatives. Can positives donate to negatives? You also look at the table and see. Can positives donate to negatives? If you're the donor, if you're a positive, can you give to these negatives? No. no. You can't. And it's not enough to know that the answer is no. What's the reason? If you're positive for RH, your red blood cells have what? RH antigen. Not talking about ABO, just talking about positive blood, RH antigen is present. Okay, if you're a negative person, we, we care about, if you're negative for <clears throat> RH, that means you have the antibody against it. So if the positive donates to the negative, Going to cross your app. That's the reasoning. So let me ask the inverse question. This is a no. Can negatives donate to positives? Yes or no? Yes. Now the answer is yes. We see it on the graph. Negatives, you can donate positives or negatives. And again, what's the reason? If you're, neg if you're negative for RH, just considering RH, so you don't have the RH antigen, okay? Um, if you're positive for RH, you're, you're not gonna have the antigen, so I'm not gonna draw anything there. Even if you had it, I mean, there's nothing to attack. All right, so the principle is, do you have the antigen or not? Is the antibody going to attack it or not? 
That's the way you have to think about things. Don't try to memorize the table. It's not going to help you when you have to explain things. <coughs> Although it is a useful re reference. So in your lab, you're going to have like some unknowns. You know, patient presents themselves. You don't know what type they are, and you have to send the blood to the lab to test. So what do you do? You test for the presence or absence of R3 antigens, the A, the B, the RH. That's what blood typing is. In your lab, you'll type unknown blood. I think we have four unknowns in our lab. Typing is typing for the presence or absence of the antigens. Test for presence or absence of the three AGs, the antigens, the A, the B, the RH. So you should have three wells. Test wells. We use fake blood, by the way, but it gets the point across. Um, okay, well, let's say you you can't see the RBCs. Let's say let let's um, pretend that the person is going to be. I'll, I'll just tell you, but you're not supposed to know. It's unknown. But let, let's, for the sake of teaching, say it's. Type is B negative, but you don't know that. If you're B negative, how many antigens do you have? One, two, or three? Two. One. It's so, okay, we're still learning. And it's one, and which one is it? It's the B. Is RH there? No. No. Is A there? No. Okay, well, anyways, B negative. Okay, but you don't know that. Pretend like you don't know. Red blood cell, I'll draw my circles for the B. You don't know that, you can't see it. Uh, so how do you test for it? Well, let's put it in all three wells, huh? <clears throat> what you could do in the lab, have a bottle of serum against that has all the antibodies against A, B, RH. So if you add the antibody against A, is it going to cross react? No. So it should just kind of stay unagglutinated. Okay? Uh, add, add it, okay, in your lab. And uh, will it cross react? Yes, this should agglutinate. Agglutination. First one is no agglutination. Sometimes just people put negative, positive. It means the same thing. It did not agglutinate, it did agglutinate. The other one, add a serum of anti-RH to your unknown blood. What's the result? No agglutination. Negative result. <clears throat> Look at number two. What's the type? O positive. That's a negative result. Negative result, positive result for RH. RH is there, it's positive blood. When both of those are absent, that's type O. O positive. What's the type for number three? B positive is the blood type. Negative for A, positive, positive. B and RH are there, B positive. 
and four. It is RH negative, and it's, it's O. It's O negative. And what's that special type called? Universal donor. Very good. So that's how you type blood. So I'll give you one clinical example of um, a cross reaction here with pregnant moms. And if a mom is <coughs> RH negative, but dad is RH positive, the fetus will be RH positive. And that's okay. There's a separation of the placenta between mom and baby's blood. But when baby's born, there's some blood exchange. There's a lot of blue hemorrhage. And so mom might be exposed to uh, RH positive blood, which is fine for the firstborn. Um, they're already gone. Okay. But then after, mom will um, develop an antibody titer against RH. So if a second baby comes along who's also RH positive, that antibody could cross the placenta and cause what's called urethroblastosis fatalis. And it's easily treatable. You just give them some Rogam or something to, to zap out the, the antibody. So precautions can definitely prevent it. <clears throat> okay, um, I don't want to sign this anymore, but if you still have access to Physio X, there's some activities that I cover today that could help you if you want to like just do some practice, okay? But I'm not gonna assign it, so forget about due date to be announced. The announcement is I'm not assigning it. Uh, but anyways, that um, concludes the blood typing portion, and I wanna go into the next batch of slides called, well, basically it's blood coagulation, but I'll also talk about leukopoiesis and thrombopoiesis. This is the next batch of slides for those of you that have for now. And I talked about the formation of red blood cells, but not the other ones. So um, let's remember that it's the bone marrow, right? That's what I said. I call it here squeezing blood from a bone. <clears throat> the output is astronomical. I mean, you don't have to know these numbers, but the lifespan of an RBC is about 120 days. You want to churn out about two and a half billion of those cells uh, daily. 50 to 100 billion of granulocytes and the monocytes. You have the white blood cells and naive lymphocytes. Their lifespan is a little shorter. Um, they're fighting infection for us, so we need to churn out a lot more. So the bone marrow, uh, along with a little bit of spleen and liver, it's a major site of removal of the aged and defective cell. And here's a picture of bone marrow. It's not normally a histology slide we keep in our collection, but the, all the purple cells are the stem cells that we've been talking about. And all the white things you see are um, not stem cells, but adipose. And as you age, the cellularity decreases and the adipose increases. Okay? But red marrow in adult should have more cellularity. And so what's happening in the bone marrow tissue, just like with the red blood cells, you get the formation of white blood cells and platelets. This just shows the white blood cells. Okay? And they're all derived from the stem cell right up there, the hemocytoblast. You know, all the blood cells, all the formed elements are derived from the hemocytoblast. talked about before the break was for the red blood cells, EPO is very important. We need an EPO so you can progress past the pro-urethral blast stage. That got you to that one phase where the cells were urethral blasts. I got you to the other stage where your normal blast. I got you to the stage where you're a reticulocyte. <clears throat> then full on urethrocyte. 
you enter the circulation. Okay, the same thing here. What they're showing you is um, this left side is what I'm going to talk about. All these stem cells here. Basically what goes on here is you have these colony stimulating factors, these granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factors, GMCSS. What they do is they take some of these stem cells and they act on these colonies of cells called GMCFUs, which stands for, I'll write it out over here, granulocyte monocyte colony forming units. Granulocyte monocyte. Colony forming units. So those GMCFUs are targeted by these GMCSFs, and that basically, um, I'm kind of simplifying what's going on here. You're going to get out of those colonies of cells some cells that form monocytes and some cells that form these granulocytes. <clears throat> so out of there, <clears throat> some um, under the influence of MCSF, those monocyte colony stimulating factors, you'll get monocytes. And also um, acting are some granulocyte CSFs. So out of there you'll get <coughs> two. all of those granulocytes, the eosinophils, the basophils, and the neutrophils. Eosinophils, basophils, And neutrophils, commonly known as known as quote unquote granulocytes. <clears throat> I won't talk too much about it, but you also get on the right hand side here, you get you get your lymphocytes. Two varieties of lymphocytes. There's the B's and the T's. B lymphs, T lymphs. Um, other cell types you should know, even after these mature cells that circulate in the blood, monocytes can become macrophages. So under monocytes, put macrophage. That's your major immune garbage collector to revolve the non-cell cells. And also, you should know that some of the B limbs can become plasma cells, plasma. Those plasma cells actually generate antibodies. Okay, and we'll talk more about that later. So, so basically what I have on the board here is all of these cells, the red blood cells, and all of these, which are considered white blood cells, come from the hemocytoblasts. The only thing I don't have is the Platelets, platelets also derive from the hemocytoblast. There's a cell called the megakaryocyte. Also in the bone marrow, just like all of these. And um, there's a hormone called growth factor called thrombopoietin, or TPO for short. 
not to be confused with EPO. When it acts on the mycocarial sites, that cell will help um, form the, the development of platelets and get them into circulation. Platelets are thrombocytes. I'll call them platelets here. Well, anyways, okay, that, that finishes off all the form elements that, that are on the bottom of our flow chart here. So some functions of the leukocytes. A nice picture of them here. Uh, Never let monkeys eat bananas is a simple memory jogger to help you recognize the, the prevalence of the white blood cells. I mean, they're very few compared to the red blood cells, but of the white blood cells, the neutrophils are the most um, prevalent in a drop of blood. Then lymphocytes, so you see these the most. Then it gets harder to find in the drop of blood on the slide, the monocytes, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Okay. In terms of um, function, we got some facts for neutrophils and eosinophils. Try to give you the, the most basic facts on how you can identify them. If you see a picture of it or if you have to find it on the slide from our collection. Look at the nucleus. It's multilobular. It's not a round nucleus, it's multilobular. Multilobular nucleus. And they have that nice color that you see on the slide there. Their main function is phagocytic. There, there are they're great phagocytes for your immune system. Okay, so in a word, that's their function, your phagocytes. Eosinophils. The cells are named for their color. Remember what uh, color eosin is? They take up a red stain. So look for their red cytoplasm. They help um, attack parasites. So let's say if you have a tapeworm or something, you may have elevated levels of eosinophil, eosinophils. Usually not a problem for, well, here in the United States, usually not. have a whole lecture on them. Just know there's two varieties, the B and the T's. I'll get into that in a future lecture. In terms of identifying them, you can't tell a B from a T. It's just, they're like all nuke. All you see is a little rim of cytoplasm. That's it. Huge round nuke. Maybe a, a rim of cytoplasm. Uh, the monocytes, they become macrophages. That's what's important about them. They circulate as monocytes. They become macrophages when they um, leave the bloodstream and fight infection. If 
you ever see me use the term M phage, that's my shorthand for macrophage, because that symbol is for phage. Uh, okay, well, anyways, macrophages are, again, your number one fighter of infection, so I have some uh, functions here that may indicate viral, fungal infection, any kind of infection. They're, they're larger cells. I, I used to try to look for that kidney-shaped nuke that you see there in terms of identification. And the basophils. The basophils are hard to find. If you do find one, like in this picture there, you can't see the nuke. Their function is for um, histamine releasers. They help um, enhance a, an inflammatory response. Histamine chemicals, they attract fluids to the area that flush out the infection. It causes swelling, but helps fight the infection. Basophils. Histamines. Inherits inflammation. <clears throat> now you can't see the nucleus, the dark granules obscure the nuke. So switch gears from white blood cells to blood coagulation. Um, it's to prevent shock, and shock can be caused in different ways. And since we had a, a cardio unit, it's easy to understand this. We had some test questions on these different things. Shock could be caused by a heart attack or acute MI. If you have a damaged heart muscle, you can't sustain blood pressure. So what I had said on the test was, you know, blood cardiac output goes down, blood pressure goes down. That's shock. Uh, neurogenic shock, peripheral blood vessels dilate. Okay, I think that was another test, test question, right? Because you can't constrict. So the default is to dilate. Let's remember the sympathetic tone. Blood vessels only have sympathetic inputs. So if the sympathetics are gone, the default is to dilate. So that way, all the blood is going to leave the arteries and pull in large veins away from vital organs. That can cause shock. Hypovolemic shock, simply blood loss. Okay. So it's, it's important to study how if the, um, the percentage of blood is removed, if you're bleeding, at some point, the blood pressure is going to drop. So hopefully, if the blood vessel that's broken isn't big enough in coagulation, it can stop the bleeding. Okay. So let's talk about that. The fancy word for a blood clot is hemostasis. It's a fast, localized coagulation reaction of blood in response to uh, vessel damage at the site of injury. Okay? The hemostasis prevents hemorrhage or bleeding to prevent shock. Hemostasis is usually presented in three steps. Now, it, um, for blood coagulation to occur, it doesn't necessarily have to occur in this order, although it can. Okay, I'll, I'll present it that way. prevents bleeding, and it starts with a damaged vessel, which will trigger a vascular spasm. <coughs> and it's a spasm of tunica media. It's a spasm of the smooth muscle inside the blood vessel wall.
this helps stop the bleeding because if you recall, spasm will cause vasoconstriction. So basically, this is a vasoconstriction event. Uh, VC event increases the resistance from blood flowing, right? So it helps to stop the bleeding. So the fancy way to put it is you're, you're decreasing the transmural pressure. But basically, this picture illustrates the idea to help stop the bleeding. <clears throat> so that's one way the artery can spasm. Another way that you can help this situation is to apply pressure. You apply pressure to a wound. You can help this um, spasm and help to stop the bleeding, keep the blood in the arteries. All right, the next step is you want to plug the hole. So to bridge the gap, a, a platelet plug may form. Um, what happens is the flowing blood has platelets in it, and they, they're going to bind to the uh, exposed collagen fibers. So platelet plug formation. Oops. At the site of injury, the, the platelets that are flowing by they bind to exposed collagen fibers that the, the flowing blood normally does not see. Bind exposed collagen fibers. So how do platelets get in the blood in the first place? Um, I have a couple of slides showing you the megakaryocytes, the formation of platelets. And we kind of already noted it on our uh, chart earlier, right after the break. I said that the hemocytoblast can give rise to this, this megakaryocyte cell here. It doesn't get there unless you have TPO. So megakaryocytes respond to thrombopoietin, or TPO. On stimulation by TPO, the megakaryocytes the cells that produce platelets increase in size and number, increasing the platelets. So what happens is the megakaryocyte, it extends a little pseudopod and it literally flakes off the platelets. So the platelets are little packets of cytoplasm of the megakaryocyte. That's all they are. They're not complete cells, are they? Hence the term formed elements. They're just basically pieces of the megakaryocyte. They float around. They, ex they bind to exposed collagen fibers at the site of injury, and they can help plug it. It's literally called the platelet plug. So the characteristics of the platelets are shown here. They have no nuke, right? But they have most of the other organelles that will be in the cytoplasm of a megakaryocyte. I guess the thing to know is that they have good adherent capabilities so they can bind. They have a lot of membrane proteins. They also transport uh, chemicals and form the clotting. So they form a temporary patch. Okay. The real plug is fiber. That's clotting factor one, but we're not there yet. This is just a temporary plug. So the best thing is to look at, this is the best picture of activated platelets I've seen. See these big round uh, cells there? Those are activated platelets trapped in fiber. Yeah, but I just want to show you what platelets look like. On our slides, again, they look like the little specks. Right there, right there. They appear as little fragments, which they are. They're literally fragments of the megakaryocyte. The thing about it is, in hemostasis, an unactivated platelet must become activated. So, in our step two over here, the platelet plug formation, when you bind to the exposed collagen fibers, activation occurs. Activation of the platelet will include, first, morphological changes. The cell needs to change shape, as you can see on the picture there. Morphological changes. You go from kind of a, a small fragment and you transform into, you kind of puff up. 
and you increase the membrane proteins so you're more sticky. You can stick to the area of uh, injury, and you can stick to other platelets to make a good plug. Okay. The other thing are um, chemical changes. You, you secrete uh, clotting factors. release of chemicals that enhance <clears throat> clotting. Oh, this is a good picture to look at. They show you the area of injury. And if you remember the tunics, TI, TM, TA. They show you the vascular spasm. If you look at these um, smooth muscle cells in cross-sectional view, they're not contracted. The ones that are bigger are. Okay. But you still have a gap. So these platelet plugs are bridging the gap. And they're all sticky and stuck together, filling the gap there. They call it platelet aggregation, this plug. The chemicals that are released, I have them on the next slide here. I would write down ADP, serotonin, and thromboxane A2. Those are the chemicals. ADP, serotonin, thromboxane A2. Those are the chemicals that help, well, you can see it says on the slide. They promote aggregation, and they promote more vascular spasm. They, they help the clotting process, and they help stop the bleeding. To go back to this slide, one other thing I want to add, you got a plug here. What you want to do is you want to prevent clotting in other places where you don't need it, because the neighboring areas are uninjured. So what neighboring endothelial cells do is they release Phosphocyclin and nitric oxide, what that does is it restricts aggregation to the injury site. and nitric oxide, NO, to restrict aggregation to the injury site. Put a star next to that. Students tend to ask me this question a lot. Of, study guide question, well, what about those chemicals? So if you put a star next to it, it's easier for me to find in your notes, right? Hopefully you could find it, though. If you have trouble, I can help you. <clears throat> All right, so that's step two. Spasm, plug, the real deal for blood hemostasis is coagulation or fibrin mesh formation. Step three here, okay, they call it coagulation. Coagulation. Really, it's about fibrin mesh. You want to form a mesh. And you know what a mesh is? It's just a thick 
Well, you'll see it. A mesh. So I'll put Roman number one. It's all about getting the clotting factor one so blood can coagulate. Okay. You're just making a basic mesh and blood will flow into it and that traps the blood cells and that's a clot. Okay, that's coagulation. That'll stop the bleeding if the damage is not too serious. So fiber mesh formation can be understood in these three steps. Two pathways to prothrombinase. There's a common pathway to thrombin and then that'll get you to fiber. So one, two, three there. Think about that first one, the two pathways. Well, you have to know both pathways. And what happens is you can get a little bit of fiber in quickly in this intermediate stage, and it'll be reinforced later by more fiber. And um, so the two pathways to get to uh, your prothrombinase, this factor 10 right here, are on the left and the right. And they're called, on this slide, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. <coughs> Uh, just in terms of number of steps, by looking at the figure, which one do you think is faster? Intrinsic or extrinsic? Extrinsic is faster because there's less steps. Okay. And it's really all about getting these activated clotting factors to form these complexes. That's the key to understand. But in both cases, they're acting the same injury site. So, so. Let's say you have a, a break in the vessel wall there. Break in the vessel wall. So you want to concentrate the complexes for the break. So for the intrinsic pathway, you want to localize a complex of activated factor 9 and 8. 9 and 8. They form a complex. <coughs> Nine. Okay, they form a complex, but to get there, it's like 12 has to activate 11, which activates 9. So 12 to 11 to 9. So 12 to 11 to 9. But that's not all. There's other things like Platelet factor three and calcium, which have to participate. PF3, calcium. Those both play a part. So you have 12, 11, platelet factor three, calcium. They all help the formation of this complex. Comp clotting factor nine to eight. On the other side, you need calcium to help formation of the complex <clears throat> seven to TF, which is called tissue factor. Okay, because um, basically, when you have an injury, injured cells release tissue factor in this injury here. Tissue factor on this slide is TF. It's also known as clotting factor three. Okay. So clotting factor three or tissue factor, it forms a complex with fact clotting factor seven. TF 
seven, calcium helps, you get your complex. It can get confusing because you have names and numbers, like the cranial nerves have names and numbers, same idea here. I'm only teaching you a handful of clotting factors, but they should all be tabled out in chapter 17. Let me see if I can find a good table for you here. <coughs> Yeah, on page 654 on the 10th edition, there's a nice table of blood clotting factors. Six five four. I have the 10th edition here that I'm looking at. But anyway, it's in chapter 17. You'll just flip around and find it. Well, anyways, they're all listed there. You only have to know the ones I'm presenting. I'm presenting most of the ones that are listed here. But they give you the number and the name. Because I use them interchangeably, so I just want to make sure you have a reference you can look it up if you had to. For example, seven is also called pro-convert, so you have to know both. Let's see here. Okay. Well, anyways, we got our complexes. Those complexes will help you activate factor ten, prothrombin activator, or sometimes it's called prothrombinase. It's an enzyme. So. These two intrinsic, extrinsic pathways, this one's extrinsic, put a big arrow, big arrow, they kind of merge to a common pathway, okay? Intrinsic, extrinsic pathway, call this the common pathway, because it's common to both. You activate prothrombin activator. also called the activated form of factor 10. So it's really about all this up here, both of those pathways, is to get to factor 10, get that activated. <coughs> then you have the common pathway to clotting factor one. So, so far we've talked about mostly intrinsic, extrinsic pathways. When blood is exposed to tissue factor, which is outside the blood, hence the term extrinsic, the flowing blood normally doesn't see the tissue factor. So when it does, you know, uh, it's, think of this as a shortcut to factor 10, when the flowing blood sees the tissue factor. Okay, the intrinsic pathway, all of those clotting factors are within the blood. Blood can clot all by itself on the bench top, okay? You don't need to see the tissue factor. So this pathway, um, basically, is just a longer pathway to get to factor 10. Extrinsic pathway, a little bit faster. But both pathways converge to the common pathway to get the prothrombin activator, which will convert prothrombin to thrombin, which is known as factor two. So, thrombin will convert fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrinogen is soluble in the plasma. We want to get it to come out of solution. So, thrombin will convert that to its insoluble form, fibrin. You get your fibrin mesh. Put fibrin mesh, your little strands of fibrin. Fibrin is insoluble when activated by clotting factor two, thrombin. Fibrin is clotting factor one, as I said before. <clears throat> So what both pathways are doing, intrinsic and extrinsic, they're basically localizing the effects of factor 10 at the site of injury, okay? And so calcium is also needed. Here's a nice picture of it, like I showed you before, the fibrin mesh. So what coagulation of blood is, the blood, the formed elements becoming trapped 
in a fibrin mesh. And that stops the bleeding. Okay. And that'll allow the healing to take place. So you've managed to stop the bleeding, but you need to heal the vessel. So what are some things that happen post-coagulation? Stopping the bleeding is, is crucial, so you stop losing blood. But now we repair. So the first thing you do is you bring the edges of the injured vessel wall together. Okay, and if um, the damage is too big, like for example, you get a cut and it's too big, you have to go and get stitches. Because the stitches just bring the pieces of flesh together and allow the tissue to heal. Okay. Same thing is happening here. The clot, it retracts, and so it allows for vessel re repair. Clot retraction, like I said, get a tighter seal. Now the vessel can repair. I would, um, in terms of repair, note the growth, the growth factors. PDGF and VEGF. Plainly derived growth factor. What that does is it helps rebuild basement membrane and tunica media. <clears throat> VEGF, vascular endothelial derived growth factor will help rebuild the endothelium of TI. You have some scar tissue, but after you've basically repaired uh, the blood vessel, now you can bust the clot. So you need an anticoagulant. Okay? You don't need it anymore. So fibrinolysis is the formation of your clot buster. And the, the main clot buster is plasmid. Plasmid is your major clot buster. activator or inhibitor of that is present. So you have TPA or TPAI. Okay. Increased levels of tissue plasminogen activator will allow the formation of plasmin and clot busting can occur. Um, clot formation will remain if you have more TPAI tissue plasminogen activator inhibitor. Okay, so this will inhibit the reaction. TPAI favors clot formation, not clot busting. Because, you know, you, you can get a clot in a place you don't want. And so you, you may want more clot buster, not less. Sometimes you want it to clot to stop bleeding. But sometimes you get a clot where you don't want it. And so I, I do want you to know these medical terms here for a clot in the wrong place. <laughs> so let's say you have a blood vessel here. If you look on the inside of the vessel wall, if you have a break in the vessel wall, and you get a clot that forms, just like we talked about. It turns out the clot only partially occludes the lumen, so blood can still flow around it, 
That's called a thrombus. Cloth that adheres to the vessel wall. Thrombus. But let's say a piece of the clot breaks off and gets into the circulation. That's called an embolus. So a piece breaks off, circulates, goes downstream. However, as you branch out, the arteries get smaller. What if it gets lodged in a small blood vessel? That's not good. If it happens in the lungs, it can lead to death. It's called a pulmonary embolism. So the, the piece of clot that's floating around is an embolus. When it gets stuck, it's an embolism. And the tissues downstream can infarct and die. If it turns out at the beginning that the clot that formed was big enough to block, completely block blood flow, that's called a thrombosis. Also not good. So we can help, like I said, you can administer anticoagulants. And it's all about a balance of clot formation or dissolving it with, you know, heparin, aspirin, TPA, or clotting factors, TPAI, will facilitate clot formation, basically. Okay. But what I want to do now, with the little time that remains, I want to pass back a lecture exam four, if you want to see it. If you don't need to see it, you are excused. I will see you this Friday. I'll see you next time. Stick around if you'd like to see lecture down four. Give me a couple of minutes.